Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for those gathered here. Thank you, Lord, that you hear us. I pray, God, that you would move your words to penetrate our hearts to the places where we need to be. God, that you would instruct our path, that you would help us to surrender and to have the open ears to hear what your spirit would speak. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your provision. Thank you that your yoke is easy and your burden is light, that you have prepared a way for us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning I'm going to preach a sermon, hopefully, called Jehovah Jireh, and that uh, name can be pronounced differently, but I'm just going to go with the popular pronunciation instead of telling you the sermon title is uh, Yehovah Yireh, and just really mess you up, you know. So I won't speak Hebrew to you today. I'll go ahead and Latinize this name Jehovah Jireh, and many people already know what that name means. My provider, Jehovah Jireh, my provider, your grace is sufficient for me, for me, for me. Jehovah Jireh, my provider, your grace is sufficient for me. My God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. He shall give his angels charge over thee. Jehovah Jireh cares for me, for me, for me. Jehovah Jireh cares for me. So now we know which ones were part of that cult. Because <laughs> not everybody had heard that song before. All of us grew up in different uh, ways and different things, but... Uh, that's what it means. That's what the name means. And this is a place in the, a, a, a glimpse of life. We're going to look at Abraham and something that happened to him. And it was a moment in which he was impacted by how God provided for him. And we're going to let the story start a little earlier, but we, I want to lighten things up even a little bit more and say, man, the market is really crashing <laughs> for you that are financially minded. And uh, I, I, I started to try to wonder, how in the world can I get market advice from the Bible? And somebody told me, well, Noah is the guy who understood the stock market better than anybody else. Because Noah floated all his stocks while the world was liquefying. Uh, <laughs> you got to love me. Or hate me. So Abraham is this guy that many of us have heard of, but he lives in this land called Ur, and it's a time in which the world is already beginning to forget God, and they're certainly not tapping into his name and all that it means. And today we're just going to slice off part of uh, the attributes of God in, in, in this aspect that he is our provider. Uh, but there are other names that some of you might be acquainted with, this Latinized form of Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, uh, Jehovah, you know, a lot of different things we could be looking at. And so we're just going to touch today, and I may launch out into another series. I'll think about it and pray about it and see if that's what God wants or not, and uh, we'll find out. But uh, this this period in Abraham's life is a strange time because he and his dad are basically called to leave their land. What do you want, David? <laughs> and so, you know, when you ask somebody in ancient culture to leave their culture and their land, you're probably asking the most horrific and difficult thing that could be ever asked. In today's society, we move, there's businessmen, the people we fly about, it's, it's, it's relatively easy to move. Mm -hmm. And I know the Schmidt family would disagree with me right now. <laughs> and I disagree, but in comparison to leave your culture, to leave your tribe, to leave everything you know, to leave your history, to leave everything you've been taught, and to launch out into a new world and to step into a new place because you feel like you're under the unction of God and you go and do it, th that was um, life-changing. It was uh, a point at which 
everything that Abraham and Terah, his father, was going to experience was going to be new. It was going to be fresh. It was going to be different. And so I am imagining that it was an extremely difficult challenge for the family to be told, go. Yeah. Go to a new place. Start a new life. Break with your past. You don't get to live in your past anymore. You don't get to live in your heritage. God steps into their life and says, you need to break with your past. And it was an intense struggle for Abraham. I, I, I probably going to throw him a little bit under the bus today because uh, he struggled in, in his new journey. He got scared. At times he lied to people about who his wife was and he was deceptive to try to protect what little bit in life he still had. And so he, he argued about um, how is God going to preserve my line and he accepted his wife's advice to go in unto her servant and try to create his legacy. And it was a confusing time for him because God had put him in a place. He had displaced him. And so he kind of uh, had direction, but at the same time didn't always take the direction. And it put him in uh, weird circumstances. And there are many stories we could key in on that. But um, it comes to a point in Genesis 15, and this is a passage that I do want to read to you, that... Uh, Abraham has just got done rescuing his nephew, who also is in bad straits. He and his nephew had been blessed by God so much, and at one point he tells Lot, you go one way and I'll go the other, and Lot goes and heads towards Sodom, and, and so he kind of binds himself to the beautiful plains of Sodom and the green and the lushness, and it seems like this is a good place to live. But in time, that, that area becomes the focus of war, and they're overcome with war, and Lot is captured with his family, and Abraham's like, man, i got to rescue my nephew. And so he, uh, Abraham gathers his people together, and they go, and they triumph, and, and they rescue Sodom and Gomorrah. And at this point, Abraham's in his 80s. He's not a young guy. He has no kids. And he's probably wondering, what in the world did you bring me here for? And he, vic, victory happens. He, he overtakes these armies that attack Sodom and he rescues his nephew and he puts everything back in place and he offers an offering unto this guy named Melchizedek, which we could spend a whole sermon on or two. And uh, Sodom, the king, is like, I, I want to reward you for what you've done. David, if you keep coming up here... <laughs> I'm going to make you preach. <laughs> Is that what you want? Because you can. Is there anything else that is pending? In <laughs> is the screen on fire? Or? We can't find a clicker. We can't change slides because there's no clicker. It probably doesn't matter. I'll probably never get off the first slide. <laughs> Especially if you keep interrupting me. I will stay here. But but the commercials are good because everybody's smiling now. <laughs> so here he is, and, and uh, the king of Sodom says, you know what, I want to pay you for rescuing us. And Abraham basically says, you know what, I don't want anything you would like to pay me because I don't want anybody to think that my great wealth and the provision of life and the place and standing that has been given to me was because of you. In the end, I want the world to know that what God has done for me in my life was given to me by God and not by the help of Sodom and Gomorrah. Eh, there's a whole lesson in there. But the Lord after this, in chapter 15 and verse 1 after this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your very great reward. God says to Abram when the world wants to offer him everything and he turns it down, God says, don't worry, Abraham. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to be your shield and I'm going to be your reward. And that word reward means so much more than reward and your different Bible versions might give different wor words for it. It, it. It's your strong tower. I'm going to be your refuge. I'm going to be your fortress. I'm going to be the one who stands for you. 
And so uh, Abraham is comforted with those words, but he, he, you know, from the abundance of the mouth, the heart speaks, right? And so just bubbles up out of him and he says, Oh, sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. If you read it, it almost sounds a little bit bitter. God just got done saying, I am going to be your reward. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to magnify you. I'm going to be your shield and your fortress. I'm going to prosper you. And Abraham, who has left his heritage and left everything and has no home and he's a wanderer in a strange land, says, for what? It all dies with me, God. Everything I have, I'm just going to give to my servant. And God says, no, I've got a bigger plan for you. And most of us know the story, but some of us don't. And the, the story is God says, I'm going to give you a child. And through this child, I'm going to bless your posterity. I'm going to bless your descendants and they will be like the stars of the sky. Look up, Abraham. Count the stars if you can, for that's how your offspring will be. And Abraham and Sarah at the beginning of this news chuckle. They laugh. There's different places in the Bible, two places where you'll see they laugh because it's, it's overwhelming. Because at this point, how old did I tell you Abraham was? In his 80s, you know, at this point in, in 15. And yeah, he's going to get to be 100 before that, that promise is sealed. And uh, not sealed, but he's going to be reminded. And so it's, there's a little bit of laughter because... What a joke that is. I mean, what if I told you that uh, maybe, I don't want to insult anybody, but what if I told you that David and I are having another baby? We are getting to that age where that's getting a little more challenging. But what if I told you that in 30 or 40 years from now? What if I was Lee over here, 92? And Lee said, hey, my wife's at home. I didn't want to bring her in today because she's getting some morning sickness. <laughs> it would be weird. It'd be astounding and it'd be miraculous. But the more miraculous thing is that the Bible tells us that Abraham believed God wow. and it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham understood that this must be true and this is part of the promise and this must be why you brought me here. And wow, God, what a future I have. And, and it's not really about him. It's about everything that happens after him. And God has had him to forsake his past because he says, I have a beautiful future for you. <clears throat> and he embraces it. He's exciting about it. And, and, and this is where we come into the story in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 1. And that's where we'll be. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I'll tell you about. That's like the craziest verse in the whole Bible. Especially for those of us who have gotten to know God and love God and he's begun to, to make sense to us. But all of a sudden, this amazing, powerful God who is omniscient, omnipresent, he, he, he knows everything from past to future. There's nothing that can stand in his way. He indeed is sovereign. Nothing can stop the intentions of God. He goes and he speaks to this man, Abraham, and he says, I want you to kill your son like I was about to do to David if he popped up here one more time. <laughs> Kidding. That's weird. It's weird on a hundred counts. But one way it's weird is, wait a second, God, isn't this why you brought me here? Isn't this the promise on which you based my righteousness? That I believed 
You, when you told me that I would be a blessing to nations, you are asking me to sacrifice your promise? It's more than a son. Now, God had not only called him to abandon his past, but he had called him to abandon his future. Why? Why would God stretch a man so far? What do you think? To show him what he's made of so he'll realize it. To show Abraham what God's made of or to show Abraham what he's made of? Okay. Show Abraham what God's made of. So we, we need to see if Abraham's really going to put God first. Okay. What's sad is you took something that was so nasty during a society that was doing that all the time and then asked him to do the very same thing all these heathens were doing. So everywhere around Abraham in this foreign land that he doesn't feel comfortable in are Canaanite people, and this is what they're doing. Their form of worship towards Baal and Asherah and all the gods that they would create is to sacrifice their children. <coughs> Strange. Early the next morning, Abraham got up. Doesn't say anything about him fighting with God over the issue. It just says early the next morning, Abraham got up, saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, so it took him three days to get there, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. That's an interesting we there. Granted what God had just asked him to do, Abraham tells his servants, we're going to go off and worship and we're going to come back. Wow. Statement of faith. Another glimpse of Abraham's faith that whatever God was asking him to do, God would be the provider in making it well. It, it's as if Abraham believed the promise of God so much that God had promised that through his son Isaac, through this promised son, would come so many tremendous blessings that despite the fact that it seemed as if God was saying, stop, close the door on this promise. We got to rescind this promise. We got to break this promise. Despite the fact that it felt as if God was saying to kill the promise, Abraham believed that whatever was going to happen, he was going to return with the promise. It was strange. Hebrew author uh, tells us in Hebrews that by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham, verse 19 of Hebrews chapter 11, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a matter of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. So the Hebrews author is telling us that and it, 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 they imagine that, that Abraham could reason that no matter what it looked like on the outside, that the God that he served was so powerful that if was necessary, that even if he carried through with the killing of Isaac, which he doesn't, uh, story spoiler, he doesn't, but if he had done it, that God would raise him from the dead. That, that's an amazing degree of faith. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Father? Yes, my son. Uh, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? There's a lot of discussion in the theological world of how much did Isaac know? And we might ask today, just for some of you, how old was Isaac? 33 to 35. You know, we take this text out of context and we might assume because we read the word boy or lad or even the story, we might think he's seven or eight. 
No, as we add the stories together and we look at the stories that are coming, he's, he's probably 25 to 33 years old. And the rabbis all think he was 33, which I conveniently like because the rabbis, all these Jewish scholars are saying he's 33. And I'm thinking, wow, there's a parallel to this whole story and it has to do with Jesus. Yeah. And when Jesus was crucified, he was 33. 33. So I'm like, oh, I'll throw us another parallel. I'll take it. Give it to me. But we can't prove from the text exactly how old he was. We throw a lot of these different cues in. But here Isaac is, a man really, yes. carrying the wood on his back. And how old is Abraham? Well, he's 100 plus whatever age you want to make Isaac. And maybe a few more years. So he's not a young guy. Kind of a strange little relationship there. And Isaac is carrying his own wood for his own sacrifice. You know anyone else that carried his own wood for his own sacrifice? Jesus. Jesus. Abraham says to his son, Yes, my son, the fire and the wood are here. Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. And the two of them went on together. I mean, we know from the beginning of the story that Abraham knew what he was about to do. He was about to crush the promise. And it meant everything to him. And yet when his son spoke to him about, what are you about to do, God? I mean, Dad, what are you about to do, Dad? He says, well, we're going to make an offering under our God. Well, Dad, you, you got all the tools here, but... I, I don't see the lamb. At this point, he could have said, you're the lamb, dude. <laughs> <laughs> or he could have said, you know what, Isaac, let's go home. This is ridiculous. Some of us might have liked God better and Abraham better with that decision. Because it seems pretty foul of a God to ask you to take the life of your child. But he says, you know what? God will provide the lamb for this sacrifice. And he's told the servants, we're both coming back. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. He bound him. So at some point, there's a need for the binding. You know, some people say, well, I think that Isaac willingly went to the altar. He might have. He may have. I, I, I don't know. The text doesn't tell us. But the text does tell us that there was a point at which he was bound. I know that when Jesus is talking about his sacrifice that he made for you and for me, he went willingly to the cross, but he was bound. And so the fact that he was bound doesn't mean that he wasn't willing. And so I can wrestle with that either way. But the fact is he's bound. And once he's bound, there's no turning back. Once you're wrapped up in the cords of and entangled with the destiny that was entailing, that was in front of him, there was no way of turning back. And he puts him up there. I, I can't imagine how difficult that was for Abraham. But honestly, I have a harder time understanding how difficult that was for Isaac. How did that mess with the mind of his son when your whole life you've been told you're a miracle child? Your whole life you've been told a story about how you're special. You're a promise. You're the future. You're the legacy of all God has planned. And your dad takes you up and straps you down to an altar and he raises the knife over your throat. What's spinning through Isaac's head? Help. Yeah, help me. I don't know. Why? 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 I'll tell you something sad. You'll never see another conversation between Abraham and Isaac in the rest of the Bible. The next time you see the two of them appear, Isaac's standing next to his brother Ishmael, and they bury Abraham together. So I don't know. 
There's more difficulty in this text than we like to do it with Christianity. We like to just say it's a parallel of, of Jesus on the cross and what our Father did for us. Yeah, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. But sometimes we fail to see the difficulties and we need to return to the reality of the story and think about how difficult this was. This was over the top. Abraham, it says... Verse 10, reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your only son. Now I know. Now God knows? Really? Is this the moment at which God realized what Abraham was capable of? You know, it's funny, in the Hebrew text, it says, Yadati, okay, which means, is, I'll do this for Davian so that you guys will know. Yadati, is it past tense or present tense or future tense? Past, past tense. It's as if God is saying, I have known. But did you know? I have known, Abraham, what you're capable of. I have known from the beginning what you're capable of. But did you know what you're capable of? Do you question the promise? Are you at this point of your journey starting to think that maybe the promise is all made up in your head? Are you at this point in your journey and starting to think that maybe uh, God is not there with you? Maybe you made the whole thing up. But from the beginning, before the creation of the earth, God has known the destinies and the boundaries of men. He knew what Abraham was capable of. Even before he put the sperm into his father's body, he knew what Abraham was capable of. Because our God knows everything about you. So who's the test for? Abraham. Who are all tests for? Us. If I'm your teacher and I test you, is it for me to know where you're at or is it for you to know where you're at? What if I have a classroom of 6,000 people and I'm in some great college and all my students are just numbers? Do I really care what your test score is? No. I could care less. But you care. And it's not till you're tested that you know what you're capable of. And at this point, Abraham is tested. And God calls it stop. At the last minute, when the blades kind of land, he says, stop. Abraham, Abraham. Now I know what you're capable of. You know, I went through my life. Is it, is it truly 1133, folks? Yeah. Okay. I went through my life, I'm not done yet, <laughs> giving up stuff. And we talked about that one Sunday a few Sundays ago. And, and God has, at different times in my life, told me just sell it all, give it all, move it all. Sometimes that's what it takes to get you to uh, disengage yeah. from the things that have you bound. If you want change in your life, you have to make decisions. There's that old adage, you know, the only thing crazy is somebody who thinks they're going to get different results for by doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. If you just do the same thing all the time and you keep asking God, I want to change, I want to change, I want to change, but you don't do anything to disrupt the pattern of your life, you're not going to change. Yeah. Okay, so sometimes God aids us in the change of life by, by doing radical things. Death, <laughs> moving, sickness, catastrophic stuff that nobody ever wants, but sometimes you come out of it with, with such a blessing. You know, the Bible says in James, it says, God does not tempt anyone. And yet here we're like, God tested Abraham. So I, I need you to understand there's a difference. When the devil tempts you, he wants to get a certain result. That result is evil. When God tests you and proves you, he wants to get a certain result. That result is good. It's holy. 
It's progress, it's growth, it's change, it's life, it's eternal, it's blessed, it's, it's peaceful. So don't mix up the testing of God with the testing of Satan. So God had called me to change all these things, and, and, and I was in the midst of one of these great changes. God had called David and I to Israel, and Josiah was a baby, and we were missionaries in the Middle East, and we're having all kinds of dreams come true. It's where David and I had met years before, and so we're reliving the dream. It's exciting. But then all of a sudden, all over the kingdom of God and all the ministers I'm connected with are in disarray because it's kind of like today. The churches that are organized, the denominations, churches that are, are unified hypothetically are having these battles about whether we should allow homosexuals to preach in the pulpit or whether we should let women have these type of roles or all these kind of things and they're rec reconsidering so many scriptures that the church has fought for for thousands of years for literally hundreds of years the church has fought for certain doctrines and today the churches are beginning to betray them and there's this disarray going on. And so we're in the Middle East and our own denomination that we were part of, which I will not mention, was in its own disarray. And I was getting emails and, and messages and reading things from ministers all over the world about the turmoil they're in and, and, and how they felt about the, some of the changes that were happening and some of the choices that were happening. And I was watching preachers' kids fall and leave the church left and right. And it bothered me. If there's one thing that really bothered me, I could, I'd, I could accept that weak-willed brethren had abandoned the doctrines of truth. But it was hard for me to see people with children, men that I respected, with children that walked away from God. Yeah. I was reading an article yesterday and it said, Civilization today is leaving religion because of the evil they see in the world. Civilization today is leaving religion because of the evil they see in the world. It should be the opposite. It should be that civilization today sees the evil in the world and they rush to the church. But the world it, itself knows that as they get more and more of the church to join them in their ranks of divorce and putrid idolatry and sexual biases and so much racism, as the world gets the church to embrace the world's morality, they know the church is not the truth. Yeah. There's no freedom in a church that doesn't offer something different than the world. Why would you go to church? Why would you serve a God if you're going to end up doing the same things as the world around you? I'm sure Abraham must have wrestled with the fact that why in the world would my God, my God ask me to sacrifice my son? I don't care if the Canaanites sacrifice their son. I'm not going to sacrifice my son. What kind of God would ask you to sacrifice your son? Boy, his struggle was rough. And so mine, I had my own little mini struggle out there in the Middle East. I'm like, I'm not going to sacrifice my kids for a church that won't stand for the truth. Why should I lay down my life for a bunch of people that won't lay down their life for God? Why would I want to serve a group of people and lay my life down and crucify my, the strength of my family, the vitality of their life for a group of people that won't have the same level of dedication for God? Why in the world would I do that? The Bible says if anyone wants to save his life, he'll lose it. No greater love has any man than this, that he would lay down his life for his brother. If a man would save, if he, he says, if, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his soul? And that goes so many different ways. What good is it would, would be for me to make my family comfortable and happy in this world and yet have us go down to the pits of hell? What good is it for me to achieve great prosperity and success on planet Earth and then toast in hell for eternity? In a burning hell that some of you don't believe in, but it doesn't matter whether you believe in it. 
It really doesn't matter. Jesus calls it a place of forever torment. What is more important to us than the people we love? Nothing. And so I left. And I, I, I kept good journals, so I know part of my struggle. You know, sometimes I talk about how Davine was struggling. But my struggle was I'm not going to lay down the life of my family for a ministry that is not righteous. But how do you do it when God says do it? <laughs> Abraham didn't get the choice. If he had it, he didn't take it. God says lay down the promise, dude. And we don't see any argument. Abraham spent a whole time bickering and gambling with God about the souls of Sodomites. When God was ready to destroy a city of wicked people, Abraham was like, God, you're a righteous God. Surely you wouldn't kill the righteous with the unrighteous. If there's 50 people there in Sodom, would you kill a city for 50? And he bickers and dickers with God, and he says 45 and 40 and 30 and 15 and 10. He finally gets God down to 10, and he thinks, maybe I've saved the city. He spends all this time mediating, interceding for the sins of a people that are genuinely wicked. And we don't hear him offer one prayer for his son. Maybe it's on the backside of all that. Maybe he was like, wow, after seeing the fire and brimstone fall in Sodom and Gomorrah, I won't dare ask God what he means by me sacrificing my son. Maybe he's at a level of trust in God that he's so advanced in his trust of God he just knows, like the Hebrew author says, that if it's possible or need be, God will just raise his son from the dead. He marches right into obedience almost without question. And it takes a while to get there. For us young Christians, we have lots of questions. God, why? God, when? God, now? Really, God? Isn't there a better way? Do I have to? Hold on, he didn't mean that. Surely you didn't mean that, God. And we begin to change the time, the place, the quantity, the when, the how. And we, we, we warp the message of the Holy Spirit that he's trying to speak to us. To try to justify staying the way we are. We say we we'll want change and when God offers change, we don't embrace it. I want, the, I want the change, God. Then kill their promise. Kill your promise. Show me that your past was not an idol. You did. You left your home country. Now show me that your future is not an idol. Show me that the very promise of God is not your idol. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. This is the beginning of what we call redemption, replacement theology. It's, it's the beginning of, it's not the actual beginning. We could argue that it happened with Adam and Eve and God gave them skins instead of grapevines to cover themselves. But it's a picture of God taking something else or someone else to pay for what needs to be paid for. And this is what he did for us. This is Jesus. He looked at our lives. He looked at what we were and he knows we are no better than Sodom. We are no better than Gomorrah. We were completely wicked. No one on the merits of their own righteous will ever scrape even the floor mat of the entry to the gates of heaven. We have all fallen short of God's glory. There's no one who deserves heaven in this building. But Jesus did. Jesus was the most obedient, most synchronized man ever. God became flesh. He became man so he could suffer like you, so he could feel like you. The Bible says so he could be tempted in all wise, in all ways, just as you are tempted. 
He could feel the oppression. That he would be the ultimate high priest, the ultimate mediator, the ultimate intercessor for you because he can relate. He understands. He feels the pain. He felt the hunger. He felt the thirst. And he felt death for you. And he offered himself as a willing sacrifice unto the blade of his father. You know, in uh, Jeremiah 7.31, there's an interesting verse. It says, They have built the high places of Topheth in the valley of Hinnom so they could burn their sons and daughters in the fire, something I never commanded, nor did it ever enter my mind. So in this passage in Jeremiah, God says, you know what? Never entered my mind that this is what you would do to your children. It never entered my mind that you would sacrifice your children. And yet we juxtapose it against this passage in Genesis. We're like, well, wait a second. Whose mind was this? How did this affect our man Isaac? For Jesus, Jesus is awesome. He says, I only do what the Father asked me to do. When he gets questions with the, the big man, Pilate, do you know I have the power to release you? Jesus is like, you don't have any power, bud, except for what was given to you from above. I'm here voluntarily. But with Isaac, it's left untold. What if you're the sacrifice? A lot of us have role-played being Abraham this whole time I've been talking. What if you're the sacrifice? You know, in Romans chapter 12, it says, basically, we're all called to be holy and living sacrifices for God. That when we embrace Christ and that when we become born again, that we live like Christ. That not only did Jesus die on the cross, but that when we become part of him, he's the head to which we are the body. That when we receive the Holy Spirit, that spirit that Christ had that was willing to lay down its life for others is what should be resident in us. It suddenly should become our mentality. We should be the willing Isaac. And if we're not, then don't expect your kids to be saved. You're just a hypocrite. You go to church, something else in your life is first. Your job is first. You sacrifice the relationship with your children for your job. You sacrifice the relationship with your children for your laziness, for your inspirations, for the things in this world that entangle you. And your kids see it. You want saved kids? Be a Christian. That's hard. But that's real. Hypocrisy, hypocrisy does not sell. The first ones to leave the church are the pastor's kids. And it bugged me. I even told God, I said, I'm not going to let my kids leave the church. I am not going to sacrifice my kids for your church. What a weird warp of entangled thoughts. God, I am not going to sacrifice my kids for your church. It's not a statement that should ever have to be uttered. What condition does a church have to get in that you would say that? The church is supposed to be holy and righteous. It's supposed to be a refuge, a place of freedom and, and a place of change and a place of hope and a place of joy and a peace that passes understanding. But when the church itself becomes the same cesspool of the world, then you're like Noah. Let's build an ark and get out of here. You're like Lot. You're vexed in your soul and you're trying to go with your two daughters, but the world of Sodom has already warped you so bad when you do get out of being destroyed by Sodom, you end up intermingling with them in intercession and drunkenness because you're too confused to understand what righteousness is. Abraham sacrifices this lamb and Verse 14, he says, Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. And today it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. It's Mount Moriah. It's what we name Moriah after. It's interesting, just as a commercial. As the angel told Abraham to stop, 
and not slaughter his son? That same angel of the Lord stood in that same place when David said, Will you keep killing these people for the sin I've committed? Won't you stop? And the angel stops. He has his sword in his hand and he's slaughtering them left and right. It's on that site that they build the temple in which the high priest will go once a year to intercede for the sins of a nation. God doesn't do anything by mistake. God knew that Abraham would never touch Isaac. That's the only way he could ask that. The only way that he could ask Abraham to do that was because he knew Abraham would not touch Isaac. And in this case, it wasn't because necessarily God had to stop him, and God does stop him, because God knew Abraham was obedient. God knew that Abraham's faith was over the top. But I think Abraham was questioning his own faith. I think sometimes you need to be tested so you can see what you're made of. I think sometimes the devil just sits on your shoulder and says, hey, you ain't worthy of that. You can't do that. You're not that kind of Christian. You're not that radical. And he's speaking these lies into your head that whole time. And the truth is you are that kind of Christian. Yeah. And you do have that kind of faith. And when the test comes, you'll prove it to the world. You'll come forth and you'll go, wow. You might not even think you were capable of it. In Micah 6, 6, it says, How shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for disobedience, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you but to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? The prophet Micah is struggling back with all these things and saying to himself, what can I give to God that would exalt him and give him the position in life that he should have? And he comes to the conclusion that there is nothing he could give to God except for his changed life. A life in which he loves mercy, he walks humbly, and he acts justly. If you want your children to carry your faith, they better see that it is not for your work or selfish reasons that you would sacrifice your time with them. If there's anything I hear kids talk about is, Dad never gave me time. Well, the time you don't give with your kids, if it's for work, don't expect your kids to love you, nor to follow you, because work's your idol. And you say, well, I've got to provide for them. How much do you need to provide for them? There's a balance. And you're right, you better provide for them. The Bible says if you don't provide for your own, you're worse than an unbeliever. A man that will not provide for his family is worse than an unbeliever. New Testament. For those of you who think there's nothing valuable in the Old Testament, New Testament teaches. Until your kids feel first, your sacrifice of them unto God will only feel like hypocrisy. What do I mean by feel first? God is first, supposed to be first in our life, but I'll tell you what, second is your family. There is nothing more important. God is first in your life, but your second better be your family. You better protect your family in a world that wants to do nothing but destroy it. The television wants to destroy your family, the ads, the internet, everything that is out there is destroying your family. It is like the whole host of the demonic forces of evil have piggybacked on every young mind to propel them away from family. Divorce is rampant. Incest is rampant. Abuse is rampant. All of this stuff that destroys family is rampant. It's just going at full force. The floodgates of hell have opened up and declared war on family. 
And so your family needs to be first. You need to protect your marriage with everything you got and protect your children. When it's that where, when it's in that position, and then God compels you to make the sacrifice. When your family knows it, they know dad loves me more than anything on this planet. When your family knows that you have that adoration, that level of love for them, and then they see you make sacrifices for God, it does one thing for them. It draws them to God. We see that Isaac hears the promise from God in chapter 26, and God says to Isaac, what I did for your father, I will do for you. As you look up into the skies, Isaac, and see the stars, I want you to try to count them. For as the stars of the sky, so shall your offspring be. And the blessing of Abraham goes to Isaac. And the story continues from one son to the next son. I hurt for the lost children of this congregation. But if you don't hurt for them, you don't love them. Romans 8.32, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. There's a, another verse in Titus that says, In hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. From the beginning, God's been working this out. From the beginning, He called you to be a Christian. From the very beginning, before you were born, before you were formed in your mother's womb, He was calling out to you, crying out to you, wooing you, asking you to come. You have contained in you an opportunity to be a blessing to this world. You say, I'm too old, I'm too spent, I've done too much, I'm, I'm not well. God loves that position. Because that's the one in which he's glorified. I've done too much wrong, Jeff. You don't know my testimony. I mean, the things that I've done, nobody has done. God loves to use that kind of person. Because it demonstrates the glamour of his glory and the miraculous power of the fact that he is sovereign. He's in control. He makes the decisions. And there's nothing that anyone can do to stand against the love of Christ Jesus that he has for you. Amen. Abraham was sacrificing the very promise of God on that altar. And he knew that God could not lie. God told him, I'm going to give you this son. And through this son, I'm going to bless you with untold blessings. And so at that point, once God had brought Abraham to a level of faith that, that was that strong, you could have asked Abraham to do anything to Isaac. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for these people. I pray that you would move in us, God. And, and, and such a message, I think, God, I pray that it will stir in us to want to be more committed to you. Father, to want to be more tapped into what your will is, what your direction is. I pray a message like this, God, will break the parental hearts for their kids. I mean, what wouldn't we give for our children? A house, a car, our bank account. If we could buy it with our efforts, with our work, what wouldn't we give for them? Father, make us to have such love. Because it's love that converts, man. It's just love that, that works, Lord. You said that you are love. And it's love that shows people what is a hypocrisy and what is, what is truth. What is a lie and what is real? Father, help us to have real love for one another. Love that will go the extra mile. We justify ourselves so much. We're lazy. God, I pray that you'd forgive us. I thank you that you give us the spirit of love to plant in our hearts. Because some of us just don't have love. I mean, obviously, we're not naturally given love or there wouldn't be a problem but you give us your spirit God so that we can be born anew and that our mind can be renewed through the mind of Christ 
I pray that you would do that in, in this place amidst these people. I pray for your mercy, God. I pray for the Jehovah Jireh. We need it because we can't provide it. We need you to provide the strength, to provide the faith, to provide the hope, to provide the love. We need you to provide the sacrifice because some of us are empty. Our pockets are empty. Our, our efforts are empty. We have nothing left to give. We've taken all our life. And yet you say, I'm the provider. I will provide the sacrifice for you because you love us that much. And so, God, we exalt you today as the provider. And we lift your name up and we say, thank you, Father, because you are incredibly merciful. And for the prodigal sons and daughters out there, Father, you know how to call them home. You gave us a whole parable about the prodigal son just so that we could have faith again to believe that they can return to the Father. And God, we pray for them today. We pray for our prodigal sons, our daughters, our granddaughters, our loved ones, God. And we plea and we ask like Abraham asked for the souls of Sodom even. And we say, God, you wouldn't let the righteous die with the unrighteous. God, you've given us a promise. God, you wouldn't give me salvation and not them salvation. Lord! Move in their lives, send the right person to say the right thing, put them in the right test to give them the right results, put them in the situation that is necessary to save their soul. Better to lose a leg and go to heaven with one leg than to burn in torment with a whole body. God, we beg you in your mercy, and we know we're just asking a prayer that you actually want. In Jesus' name, amen.